Well, blessings, everybody. Uh, if y'all can hear me, raise up your hand real quick so I can make sure everything's working okay for us. Hey, uh, thank you, Adam. And Eugene, good to see you, Eugene. And I hear Phyllis. You hear me? I hear Phyllis mumbling to herself. Yeah. But I can take care of that. (laughs) There we go. Had to make sure I got everything recorded. So anyway, it's good to have everybody here today. I've already started the recording. We're at the top of the hour. And uh, this is a uh, really rather long lesson, so I thought we better get going on this thing. Hey, Bill, real quick. Yeah. There's a few, there's a few of you that, that sent me a, a message on Gmail that wanted to know about the password to the uh, to the meeting. Yes. The password is online. Can you uh, share that with them? Yep. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah, let me see if I can. Uh, uh, oh, I can't actually do it from where I am right now. A lot of times I'll have that up and go on where I can sort of see what's going on. I guess I have it right now. So I think the uh, password for all the online courses uh, is online. So, good. we got a couple of folks that are joining in with us right now. Uh, hey, well, I believe I got it. Yeah, good deal. Thanks a lot, Adam. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into this lesson and uh, just see where the Lord leads us today, okay? Uh, Father, I thank you. Lord, for gathering us together this way. Uh, Lord, I thank you especially uh, for the, the peace that truly passes understanding that comes about by uh, being in your word. Lord, being before you, being gathered together with your body. Uh, Lord, even as we are scattered across, I know, 11 time zones uh, at the moment. Uh, Father, it's just amazing that your peace moves to each and every one of us. So, Lord, I just pray that you will have your way now. With us. Lord, that the uh, the things that would seek to distract us, the cares and concerns of this world, Lord, the trying things uh, that come against us, all those things, Lord, for this moment, that they, uh, Lord, that they will be all under your spirit and under your authority as we open your word and you see what you have to say to us. Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of each one of these folks here that's gathering together. And I ask, Lord, that you would just use us. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to jump into the uh, the course, Fatal Distractions. And so, uh, I want to try something just a little different. Uh, it's, this may not work, and if it does, not let us know real quick. But I know that uh, uh, often, usually when we do these classes right here, that we have the uh, microphones muted all the time, uh, because that does help deal with extraneous sound and all that kind of thing. But it does sort of... Uh, have a tendency to, um, I think, make it a little more difficult as far as the dialogue. And so I want to try something. If you've got a really quiet uh, microphone or a quiet environment where you are, uh, why don't we try, yeah, Adam, I noticed that yours was really quiet. And so why don't you go ahead and get sort of unmuted. If yours winds up being especially loud uh, or the background is too loud, uh, I'll just unmute us or uh, I'll just mute you back. But I thought we would try this just to see what happens. If it gets too noisy in the background, uh, we'll go back the other way, okay? So, here's lesson one. Uh, let me just read this to us, and we'll start marking up the scripture and see what the scripture has to say today. Of all the sins that can distract us from living effectively for Jesus, pride is one of the most insidious. It twists our perspective on the good gifts of God. We are tempted to believe that any successes or blessings come through our own efforts or depend on our own abilities. Pride takes our focus off God and life becomes all about us, our accomplishments, and our goals. This week, as we consider what God says about pride, the first of our six fatal distractions, carefully examine your life for any evidence that this fatal distraction has taken root in your heart. And I really want us to take that to heart that to really carefully examine it because I highly suspect that each and every one of us um, struggle with at least a modicum of of pride. So, let's start by looking at Uzziah, a man whose life illustrated the way pride creeps into our thinking. 
So we're going to look at this passage here from Second Chronicles 26. Every time we run across the name Uzziah, including the pronouns, uh, we need to draw a box around this, okay? And also, they recommend right here, it's a little harder to do this online, but they recommend that every time you see this word in the text, to say it out loud. And so I think that might be a good thing for us to do, just to mumble it, you know, under our breath kind of thing, uh, just to where we can uh, pay attention uh, to what's happening. I'm going to be flipping a lot of pages today. So let's start by looking at Uzziah, okay? Mark it with a box. Hmm. Here we are, Second Chronicles 26, 3 through 5. Uzziah, so there he is. Let me see if I can get my little uh, marker thing going here. The guy that I turned it off earlier. There we go. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. And he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God. And as long as he saw the Lord, God prospered him. So, tell me, what did we learn about King Uzziah right now? He was a good king. He, yeah, we found out that he was a good king, at least initially. How do you know that he was good? Well, chapter 4 says it right there. He did right in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Verse 4 says that he, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So what was his primary fo- uh, focus at this time? What does it tell us that he did? And you just said it. <laughs> yeah, he did what was he, right he, in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, he sought the Lord. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and he sought him. Okay? Now, why this. After telling how God marvelously helped and strengthened Uzziah until his fame spread afar, that's what it says, verse 15 is 22 chapter, the Bible describes a change in Uzziah's life. So here, we're going to draw a box around Uzziah's name and all the pronouns, and then all the way through this lesson today, every time we see the word proud or any synonym or anything, we're going to mark it with a P. So we're talking about Uzziah here, verse 16, when he... Well, there it goes. I wonder if that's going to change every time. When he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. And he was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Then Azariah the priest entered after him. And with him, that's Azariah, 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, they opposed Uzziah, the king, and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor before the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand, isn't that wild, for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priest, the leprosy broke out on his forehead. Take this page here. Before the priest in the house of the Lord, besides the altar of the incense, Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests, looked at him. Turn this back on. <laughs> they looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they hurried him out of there. And he himself also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house, being a leper, but he was cut off from the house. Whoop. There was a he on this. He here. He lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, 
was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Ooh, that's a long passage. So what do we learn about Uzziah from this passage right here? He got a big head. He was good, but he, he just had to do it bad one time. Ooh, what do you mean by that? He was good, but he just had to be bad one time. Well, he didn't, he'd have to have time to repent or something. And, but the Lord says, no, he's acting. Yeah, did you notice what happened? I forgot to mark it right here, right here while I go at the very beginning. His heart became what? Proud. Wow. Heart became proud. Why did his heart become proud? He got, he got a big head. But what do you mean by a big head? Well, he, he, pride. Pride. Yeah, pride. But what brought forth the pride? Who heard about him? Sorry. He became strong. I think it's what it was. Yeah, Mary said that too also. The power, and he became strong. When he became strong, it wasn't uh, the fact that he couldn't have been aware that he was strong. He was strong. He became strong. And when he became strong, to put it in the vernacular of the day, he, uh, what, began to believe his own PR? You know what he, I mean? He, he, he forgot who brought him where he was. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. He all of a sudden he began to realize he thought that he was the reason for what had occurred. And so, uh, what was his response when he was confronted by the priest? He got mad. Yeah, can you believe that? He gets enraged. He gets mad at it. Uh, I, what do you think about these priests right here? What do you think about what they did? Well. They were very brave to do what they did. They were confronting the king. Yeah, Sabrina, I think you're right, too. I think that was a pretty brave thing. They were literally confronting the king. But what was it that he had done? What, did the king do something he shouldn't have done? Oh, yeah. He got What's that? burn the incense. Why wasn't he supposed to burn incense? Because he wasn't a priest, and he didn't have the uh, following and the, uh, the education to do that. Oh, well, does that matter? Well, he was, the, he was not from the tribe of Levi, and only the Levites, the uh, descendants of, uh, of Aaron, were supposed to go into the into the sanctuary to burn incense. Exactly. He was not given the authority of the Most High God to do that which he had done. Has anything like this ever happened before prior to this time? Not a, I don't know. Yeah, remember when Saul did the same thing? He didn't go into the temple, but he offered sacrifice, and he usurped the priestly authority. It's always the tendency of the king to try to act like priests. You want to guess who the priests always try to act like? <laughs> Kings. Yeah. You know, it really is a problem that we have that we want to step outside of what God has anointed us to do or called us to do. So anyway, what was the punishment that came upon him? Uh, Uzziah, because of this. He became a leper. He became a leper, yeah. And uh, how immediate was that response? Not at, like, immediate. Yeah. Uh-oh. There we go. <laughs> I'm hoping my computer hangs up. Uh, doesn't hang up here today, guys, so y'all. First, we got, we got to remember that in, in, in the Bible, they can say, Leper, leprous, or leper disease. Yeah. yeah, it has a lot to do with uh, various types of skin disease. Either way you go, uh, the bottom line was the same, right? They had to be isolated from the people. And so uh, I, I found it interesting that the priest immediately did what? Hustle him out. And, and what did it say about Hezekiah right there? What was his response when he saw what happened to him while he was in the, uh, instead of in verse 20, he was leprous on his forehead and they hurried him out and he himself also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. Why do you think he himself hastened to get out? He was embarrassed. He was embarrassed? He knew what? He had done wrong. He knew that he had done wrong, but why would he hasten to get out? 
Anybody else to see? Uh, did one of the first to see him? Perhaps. Well, in case the Lord decided to do something worse. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Sabrina, I'm sort of thinking like that, too. What do you mean by worse? Been killed, too. Yeah, I like God might strike you dead right now. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hey, God. Uh, yeah, no joke. I'm thinking that's exactly what happened. So, let's press on right here. Uh, let's consider another uh, Old Testament king, it says here, who succumbed to the temptation of pride. God had saved Hezekiah in Jerusalem from the Assyrian army. Many people brought gifts to the Lord to Hezekiah. So many that other nations took notice and exalted and his, uh, took notice of his exalted situation. So, let's see what happened next. We're going to uh, read Second Chronicles 36 and draw a box every time we see Hezekiah and any pronouns and mark each occurrence of the words pride and pride. So, in those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Let me turn the page here real quick to finish the passage. However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart. Well, that's interesting. The pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the day of Hezekiah. So, uh, and I know the format of my own screen thing is a little different than the format you've got with the book, so make sure you follow along your book. Okay? What did we learn about Hezekiah here in verse 25 particularly? Well, that he wasn't as grateful as he should have been. Yeah, apparently, uh, that old thing right there we've been looking at, that he was proud. And he received the benefit from the Lord. And even though he received the benefit from the Lord, uh, he did not return anything because of that benefit. And pride set up in his heart. Since there was pride in his heart, what occurred next? What came about because of that? The wrath of God. Yeah. Wrath came on him and on who else? All his people. And on all his people. Wrath came on him and all of his people. Uh, does that principle apply today? Does the wrath of the Lord come upon us and upon other people because of things that we might do? I think so. I think so, too. The judgment of God. Do we sometimes bear fruit because of things that we do, things we don't do, places we've been, places we shouldn't have been? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You want me to give you a real-time, big-time, live example of that right now? Somebody say yes. Yes. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, I, had, I had two or three or four meetings on Tuesdays before our time together, and today we had a, a, a special gathering at a home. Our precept class didn't meet because of the holiday, but we had breakfast together. So I wound up talking with several folks before I left, and I wound up about 30 minutes late, but it's okay, everybody's eating breakfast. And I walked in, and one of the ladies says, have you talked to your wife? And I went, no, I haven't talked to her. Like, I'll leave way before she gets up this morning. And they said, uh, okay, well, you need to talk to her. And I said, like right now, they said, yes. Ooh. We all know how that is when you get that, you need to talk to your wife now conversation. <laughs> and so I, I picked up the phone and looked down there, and she'd already texted me. I figured she had, but I had my phone turned off. I had piano lessons. I had Bible studies, things like that. So I had the phone turned off. And I looked down there, and it said that our oldest granddaughter was in the ICU. She'd been stabbed. Oh, no. And I went, well, what in the world is that all about? And, of course, you know my phone battery is about to die, right? You know that's going to happen. And so I hung around with our folks, and we prayed about it. And, uh, and I got in the car. And came back and, and called real quick about three minutes before we started this class right here. And the only thing I was able to find out was that she was probably somewhere she shouldn't have been. Okay. Now, is she going to bear the fruit of that? 
Yeah. Now, the good news is she's okay. I, I think they're actually going to have her out of ICU by the end of the day, and they've got her up walking around and stuff like that. And it sounds like she's going to be okay. But sometimes when we do things, do we not bear the truth personally, family-wise, et cetera, et cetera? So uh, I share that with you just as an example right there, but also be praying. I'll, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat right here. So this is the name of my granddaughter, Ariel. So uh, y'all be praying for her, okay? Yes. So anyway, uh, what was uh, Hezekiah's response when he saw what happened here? He humbled his pride. He humbled him. Mm-hmm. He humbled the pride of his heart. Now, his initial response was he didn't return and he benefited the Lord. And he saw what was happening. He saw what was going on. Not only to him, but to the nation. To the people. So then he comes and he humbles himself. Humbled the pride of his heart. What does that tell you about the pride of your heart? What do you think? It's so insidious. It appears without... Even warning. Yeah, does it not creep in? Yeah, it's exactly. Oh, I like what Mary just chatted right there. She said it can be softened. No, I said mm-hmm. that to me. Sorry, y'all didn't see it. It can be softened. Yeah, what we is have, about this one? We have control over it. Ooh. You really think so? Yeah, if, if he humbled, he humbled the pride of his heart. There's some aspect of it that's under our control. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And we're going to see that in several of these passages, I think. Like, he humbled the pride of his heart. We have a role and a responsibility. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you. I don't particularly like that. I would like to think there's something uncontrollable and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It's like the devil made me do it, you know? But, uh, no. But the good thing is he did. He humbled the pride of his heart. You know, sometimes we think if we get rid of pride, then we become humble. But you see, he humbled it. So anyway, I think there's a lot to be gleaned from that there. You know, just sort of let that yeah. uh, spin around in our spirit right there, because there's something about that. Uh, probably the next thing. We've already seen that God does not let pride go unnoticed. So let's see what more we can learn about his view of this sin. And we're going to look at uh uh, three scripture passages right here, and we're going to mark pride. And any of the sentiments, haughty, arrogant, anything like that, okay? So, let me flip the page here. And this is Proverbs 8. I grabbed the wrong thing. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. One of the questions you're going to get in a minute is, how does God feel about these things? What do you think? Hate is pretty strong. Yeah, hate is very strong. This Proverbs 6 again. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. Haughty is the idea of pride. Every time I see the word haughty, I, I think of a particular politician of whom I might want to say, but to me, it's just the, the visual epiphany of haughtiness. I cannot say the word haughty without sounding haughty. <laughs> haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies. And one who spreads strife among brothers. Uh, what did I miss here? Where, where is it? Oh, my uh, my associate here in my class told me that I missed arrogance up here on Proverbs 8. Wow. He's absolutely correct. Why didn't y'all call me on that? <laughs> Come on, get with it, guys, okay? Oops. Oops. <laughs> well, no, really, I did that on purpose to see how well you were uh, paying attention. <laughs> I hope you caught the haughtiness there, okay? But it's, it's, look here, the Lord says that there's six things that he hates, even seven. That's, you know, that's a little device that God uses in Proverbs. He hates these things, and one of the things he hates is haughtiness, pride, arrogance. Look at this next one. But he, speaking of God, gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed 
to who? The proud. The proud, but gives grace to the, and in just a minute, we're going to mark the humble. He gives grace to the humble. So, as I turn the page here, tell me about God's attitude toward the proud. Uh, the proud. He hates it. He hates it. He hates it. But, you know, even beyond the hating, he will really do something. He opposes. He opposes those that are proud. But those who are humble, he will give grace. We'll see more about that in a second. So, the Bible is really very, very clear in its description of pride and warnings against this danger. Let's look at a few more verses to see what we can learn about this fatal distraction. We're going to mark pride the same way, along with all the synonyms, haughty, arrogant, boastful. Proverbs 15. Everyone who is proud in his heart. What's my marking thing not marking? Oh, no. Let's try it again. There we go. Everyone who is proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Proud, haughty. Oh, this fits because of the uh, uh, structure here. Proud, haughty, scoffer are his names who acts with insolent pride. Some page. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be what? Haughty in mind. Is that a problem within the body of Christ today? Mm. I think it always is. Yeah, I think it is. It's the human condition. Why is that? We are born with it, I think. Oh, you think it's part of the uh, quote-unquote sin nature? I think so. Yeah, yeah, the, the desire. Uh, and well, what is haughtiness? Anyway, this right here gives us a good idea. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with uh, lowly. Haughtiness is the idea of, of pride and puffed upness. You know, we're puffed up in relationships. And notice right here, haughtiness in mind. What does that mean? Attitude. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't even have to manifest itself in a fleshly, physical kind of way. I hear a dog back there. Mine. It is. Okay. I'm about to do this to you, Sharon. Sorry. How's that? <laughs> Don't you love it? That the dog alarm goes off in the middle of Bible study. Oh. You know, that haughty thing in mind. And sometimes that will be our mindset and our attitude, though nobody else will even know it. They may think the reason we're not around is something is something else, but no. You can be a haughty of mind and not associate with the lowly. No, don't do that. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not what? Arrogant. So, look at Second Timothy. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, holding to a form of godliness, so they have denied his power. Avoid such as these. So the Lord gives us tremendous insight as to the, uh, the struggle we have with pride, with haughtiness, with arrogance. One more right here. First John, one of my favorites, chapter 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So tell me this right here. What did you learn about the one who is proud from these verses? Apparently, nobody learned anything. What do you think, Josh? What a silence right there. That's a little out of control. So, or, or, yeah. Or, or. Yeah, the pride is from the world, and we have a role and a responsibility of being able to control this if we're truly safe. Hey, I want y'all to say hi. My wife just walked in, and she's never met all y'all. Everybody say hi. 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 <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is Karen from San Diego. This is Adam from somewhere in the Midwest. Kansas, Adam, I think? Yep. Now, this is Eugene. Eugene is in India. 
in a corner. I just told them a little while ago about Ariel, and they're going to be praying for her. Thank you, guys. So anyway, let's look at these few other passages right here uh, that will tell us some more about Christ. I'm on Proverbs 15:25 right here. The Lord will tear down the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. A couple more verses right here. Everybody knows this one. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. And then Luke 1. He, God, has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he exalted those who were humble. So tell me real quick, what has happened to those, and what will happen to those who are proud? Destruction. Yeah. What else? Destruction is one. Oh, will stumble. Yeah, stumble? I heard somebody say that real quick. Yeah. What else? He will bring down rulers. He will bring them down. Did you see that? Very good. What else? He will scatter them. Very good, Adam. I heard a scatter from within the room here, yeah. Oh, another thing, destruction, stumbling, uh, bringing down the rulers, the scattering. This is what the Lord will do with the proud. Who will execute these things? Well, we've already answered that. The Lord himself is the one that will actually bring this about. So, self-righteousness goes hand in hand with pride. The Pharisees, for example, were proud of their detailed attention to keeping the law. They were extremely careful about such things as the foods they ate and the ceremonial hand washing. However, Jesus, let me get to the next page, taught his followers that external behaviors matter less than what is in the heart. So we're going to read this out of Mark chapter 7. Mark 5 is what we've been doing. And he, Jesus, was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of covenant, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, Pride and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. So tell me, what did we learn about pride from right here? It comes from within and defiles. It comes from within and defiles. Great. What else did we learn about it? Well, just that it's, 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 it's not exactly, it's not how you uh, act or what you say, it's how you look within the is where the real pride comes from. Yeah, it's a good end kind of thing. What about this list of other stuff that it's associated with? That's pretty a scary list. Yeah, yeah, this is an evil, evil list. I and mean, he calls it evil things. You know, you want fornication and murders and thefts and adulteries and all these things you're thinking, oh yeah, I'd never do that, I'd never do that, I'd never do that. And you have pride and then what? Foolishness? Sharon asked an interesting question over here in the chat. She wants to know, uh, if you think that the that anger accompanies pride, what do y'all think? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. My wife says yes, definitely. What Maybe do y'all think? it's the fruit. I think it's yeah, fruit and evidence of it exactly. You know, sometimes people get very blustery, they get very defensive, they get angry, et cetera, et cetera, and all it is is just the manifestation of pride. Um. Uh, I'll go a step further than that, Karen. I think a lot of times that, that pride is the uh, the root, the strong man, can we say, of anger that's in people's lives. No? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. So let's look here in uh, Luke chapter uh, 18. We're going to mark something a little different this time. Uh, Jesus exposed the self-righteous attitude of the Pharisees who took such pride in believing themselves to be holier than others. So we draw a box around Pharisee every time. And then every time there's a reference to the tax collector, how do you think you're going to mark the tax collector? Oh. <laughs> a dollar bill. Oh, okay. So he, Jesus, told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You know what? I think that those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous is who? 
Pharisees, but that's okay, and viewed others with contempt. Now, here's the parable. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and another a tax collector. That's, forgive me, that's going to be sloppy. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me. I love this right here. The sinner, not a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went away to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself, and this is the principle that Jesus is, you know, building from the principle of the Pharisee, exalts himself will be humble. But he who humbles himself, and the example was what? The tax collector. What will happen to the one who humbles himself? Will be exalted. Yeah. So what did you learn about this fine Pharisee right here? He got a big head. Adam says he's full of, he's got a he's got a big head. My wife says that he's full of himself. It looks like the what? The eye in the middle of sin was where he was. Yeah, you saw that eye, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Every time I see a list of one or two or three eyes, that just takes me right back to Satan. Remember what Satan said? I will, I will. I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, what's the difference in the way that the two responded? Well, first, it's more like you said about I, 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 the tax collector is more like, I'm here, I send, you know. Was the um, was the Pharisee wrong in what he was saying that he had done? Was he incorrect in the actual deeds that he had done? No, but he was bragging about it in front of everybody. That's it. Look right here. Pride causes us to emphasize self rather than God. Uh-huh. Like the Pharisee, uh, you know, we need to be real careful. We need to look and see. Now, this is a question we can ask ourselves. What is some evidence to watch for that, we may, that may indicate that pride has become an issue? If you sit there and hear yourself singing the old Mexican hat song, ay, 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 <laughs> you know, if you hear that coming from your mouth a lot, what should we do? Yeah. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Who said that? Who said shut up? <laughs> oh, well, Phyllis can say that because she's one of the elders among us. So I know that she said that with the right heart. Okay. <laughs> but you're right. We need to examine ourselves. Hey, here's a great question. Uh, hey, Adam, let me ask you. You're a young man. Who do you behave more like, the Pharisee or the tax collector? <laughs> oh, that's a young comment. <laughs> but I just, know you're, I just know you're not going to get offended because I asked you. But we do. We need to examine ourselves and say, hey, where do I stand on that? So in light of all God's view of pride, we need to know how to avoid it. Not only know what it is, but how do we weed this out? Any arrogance? How do we deal with it? And so we're going to look at some scripture passages right here and just mark real quick. Every reference we see to pride and all the synonyms, 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 I cannot look at synonyms without thinking of cinnamon rolls, but y'all forgive me, such as, you know, empty conceit, exalt himself. And then every time we see humble and humility, we're going to squiggly line it, okay? So a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will what? A uh, no, my thing's not working right here. It's just sometimes, you know. Yeah, it doesn't want to squiggle. That's a, that's a pretty squiggle. I may also have an ID10T problem. Do y'all know what an ID10T problem is? <laughs> here it is. I, D, N, T. 
Yeah. <laughs> so from time to time when I do things with computers, I suffer from ID 10 problems. Okay? So, uh, first Peter. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourself with what? Humility. Let me see if I can do an underlying humility. There we go. Toward one another. Well, it did it on its own. So, for God is opposed to the proud. This is how God deals with pride in the life of people with computers. He does one. This kind of stuff. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself. That's getting better. Under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. And then let's go over to Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. We saw a while ago, what is empty conceit? Conceit? Pride. Pride. What is conceit? Looking more highly on ourselves than we should. That is so funny because both of y'all, my wife and Sharon, said the same thing at the same time. No joke. Thinking more of yourself than you should. Okay? Now, what's empty? Empty conceit. It's bad enough to be conceited. But empty conceit means you're conceited without any reason to feel any cause whatsoever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. That's really like the ultimate slam right there. It's bad enough to be proud. You know, it's bad enough to be conceited. Often we conceit there's at least a, a, a basis for the temptation for conceit. But here's this empty. So do nothing from that. But with humility of mind, regard one another. It's more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. See the contrast between empty conceit and emptying of yourself? Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, what did Jesus do? Humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And the last passage here. Do not be called leaders, or one is your leader. That is Christ. Boy, right there's a verse that's ignored today. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humble, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So, let's check out these last couple of questions we've got right here. We're wrapping everything up pretty quick. How is it possible to avoid uh, overcoming pride? What? Oh, it's a long list. Yeah, it's a long list. How is it possible to avoid and overcome pride? <laughs> Karen, you behave. Karen's sending me some private things here. So, yeah, you submit to God is how you overcome pride. And you humble yourself. It's a continual process. You think so? I think so. Why is that? Pride is so deceitful and sneaky. It comes in unless we get keep at it, I think. Well, it's like this. How about this situation? You've dealt with empty conceit. You've dealt with pride in your life. And you're dealing with it, and you've had victory in it. And all of a sudden, I look at you, and I say, hey... <laughs> I've overcome pride in my life. Guess, wh wh what have I just done? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to walk in humility and all things. And these last questions right here, folks, are really quite good for us. Everything we've seen lesson this week, you've identified areas. Are there any areas in our life where pride has come in? We need to ask ourselves that. And um, realize it will stunt spiritual growth. By humbling yourself under God's hands, you are saying, He is God and I am not. You acknowledge that everything good in your life, all you are and all you have and all you've accomplished, is a gift from Him. So here's the bottom line. Are we willing in humility to trust Him with every area of our existence? Are we willing to submit ourselves to Him? Let me read this wrap-up. because It's really good. God has made it clear that He hates pride. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. He knows the damage it can do to our lives 
and particularly to our relationship with him. Pride is really what caused Lucifer to do everything he did. Pride is one of Satan's favorite weapons of warfare because it causes us to take our eyes off of God and place them on ourselves. This sin often creeps in unnoticed in ways that seem benign, such as taking pride in the good things God has given us, family, jobs, influence, success. If allowed to go unchecked, pride can change our attitude toward God and undermine our relationships with him. Pride always overemphasizes self. It tempts us to believe we know better than God and that we can proceed apart from him. Pride isolates us from God and keeps us from being totally devoted to him. This fatal distraction kills our spiritual growth, preventing us from being fruitful and carrying out his plans and purposes for our life. By contrast, when we choose to clothe ourselves in humility, acknowledging God's authority, sovereignty in our lives, he will use us and exalt us. So, this week, let's do this. Ask God to examine your heart. We don't ask God to examine our friend's heart. Anybody else's heart? Our heart. To see for being pride that comes in. If God shows an area of pride, acknowledge it, confess it, move on. Really trust him with this. It says it may be difficult because it often so captures your heart and may refuse to admit there's a problem. Okay? Then the last little part here. Ask God to forgive you for being prideful. They want you to actually say the word prideful. Pray that God would give you the ability and the strength to turn away from you. Ask God to give you discernment. And remember where you came from and how far God has brought you. In other words, don't let the enemy beat you over the head of yours, okay? In any way. But trust him and God will acknowledge that we're totally dependent upon him, okay? So, with that being said, thank you, Lord. Does anybody have any questions, anything you want to say? Um, sorry, we had to hustle through that. That was a very long lesson. Um, Sabrina says that I can handle the temptation. Uh, <laughs> I can do better than others. I know better. I think she's being coming cheap up here. Yeah, Adam, I think you're right about that. Adam is saying the more you have I think we got a lot of homework here. Uh, what did you say, Phyllis? Say that a little louder. You're a little soft. I said, I think we got a lot of homework here by going over this lesson. Yeah. Mm. I mean, yes, at home. I thought these were no homework lessons. Yeah, well, I think they are, though. This is really uh, useful. Yeah. And what Phyllis is saying is, we all have a lot to do to go to school down and to say, hey, Lord. It's just me. What's going on with me? You're right. We have a lot of the word to take before God this week. Yeah. Karen, Karen said application. Exactly. That's it. Oh. Well, I tell you what. Let's, let's pray together, and then we'll have a few minutes afterwards after I turn the recording off if you don't see the visit. Uh, would someone like to pray for us as we depart? Anyone want to pray? Hey, who, uh, who, who said that? That's Sharon. Hey, Sharon, pray for us. Thank you so much. Well, Lord, I thank you for the amazing technology that's brought us together this morning and uh, this afternoon, if you some of the place. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would give us eyes to see and, and ears to hear directly from you as we examine our hearts and our lives for our pride. And, Lord, help us to turn completely and and walk away quickly. In Jesus' name, I thank you for this group, and I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Amen. 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 Hey, let's do this. Let's everybody do exactly what Phyllis said and do our homework this week. And when we get back together next week, y'all remind me at the very beginning, we'll just sort of compare notes and see what God did with us. What do you think? Okay. I think that'll be good, too. So, uh, here we go. I'm going to turn the recording off, but we'll lurk around for a few more minutes if you want to visit. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. Thank you, Dale.